test Thank you for joining us for this Shabbat table talk. And this Parsha for this Shabbat is Shalach Lecha, Sin for Yourself. And it's taken from Numbers, Bar 13, chap, uh, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 41. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to scout the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelite people. Send one man from each other, each of their ancestral tribes, each one a chieftain among them. So Moses, by the Lord's command, sent them out from the wilderness of Paran, all the main be men being leaders of the Israelites. Psalm 68, starting in verse 26. Psalm 68, verse 20, 26. Bless God in the congregation, the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin, their leader, the princes of Judah and their companies, the princes of Zebulun and the prince of Naphtali. Your God has commanded your strength. Strengthen, O oh God, what you have done for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring presents to you. Rebuke the beasts of the reeds, the herds of the bulls, and the calves of the people. Till everyone sub submits himself with pieces of silver. Scatter the people who delight in war, envoys who come out of, out, of, out of Egypt. Ethiopia will quickly strengthen, will quickly stretch out her hand to God. Sing to God, you kings of the earth. O oh, sing praises to the Lord. To him who rides on the heavens of heavens, which were of old. Indeed, he sends out his voice, a mighty voice, ascribes strength to God. His excellence is over Israel, and his strength is in the cloud. O oh God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your kingdom come. May your will be done, Lord. And we give thanks to you, Lord, for this day. And we give thanks for the, pres for the opportunity to be in your presence and to invite you into our presence as free men, free from bondage and free from slavery, free from the penalty of sin, and free from its demands and its temptations. Because you, Lord, through Christ have freed us from such a penalty. He has done it on the cross, and you yourself has, have done it through the bringing out of your children of Israel from Egypt and commanding them on the seventh day to rest and to remember the greatness of God and to worship him, to acknowledge the freedom that he has given you, that you have given them. And we acknowledge the freedom as well, Lord, free to be human, 
free to worship a God who loves and cares for us. Yes, we struggle, but we trust in God, and we trust in His promises. Yes, we waver, but you, God, you, Lord, are forgiving and kind towards us. And we remember your promise, and we ask you to God bring us back. For you are a God of kindness and love and mercy. On this day, Lord, we again invite you into our presence, as you have invited us into your kingdom. This we pray in the name of our Christ Jesus, and in the spirit which remains with us, and the Father. Amen. Amen. Barukata Adonai Elohidu Melohalam Amotse Lekem means our Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives bread from the earth. Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melohalam Berei Pri Hagapen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat Shalom Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Big kiss. Mm -hmm.
this Parsha for this week, I think is very special, as I say about them all, but this one particularly is special because this deals with the land, the land of Israel, and what happened when God tried to um, get the people of Israel to go and take the land. So we start, this Parsha is divided into two sections uh, for my um, particular Torah. And the first section is called Trial and Condemnation. It's from Numbers chapter 13, verse 1 to chapter 14, verse 45. And the second section is called Various Laws and Fringes. And it's from Numbers chapter 15, verse 1 through 41. And we'll read all of this and then we'll discuss it because it is it is very um, uh, for some reason it just struck a chord with me this, this week. It, it's something about it. Beyatabera Adonai El Moshe Lamor Shalach Lacha Anashim. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to scout the land of Canaan which I am giving to the Israelite people. Send one man from each of their ancestral tribes, each one a chieftain among them. So Moses, by the Lord's command, sent them out from the wilderness of Paran, all the men being leaders of the Israelites. And these were their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, son of Zakor, From the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, son of Hori. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, son of Jephunneh. From the tribe of Issachar, Egal, son of Joseph. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hosea, son of Nun. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, son of Sodi. From the tribe of Joseph, namely the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, son of Gemalil, Gamali. From the tribe of Ashur, Setur, son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, son of Vophsi. From the tribe of Gad, Geuel, son of Machi. Those were the names of the men whom Moses sent to scout the land. But Moses changed the name of Hosea, son of Nun, to Joshua. When Moses sent them to scout the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev and on into the hill country and see what kind of country it is. Are the people who dwell in it strong or weak, few or many? Is the country in which they dwell good or bad? Are the towns they live in open or fortified? Is the soil rich or poor? Is it wooded or not? and take pains to bring back some of the fruit of the land. Now it happened to be the season of the first ripe grapes. They went up and scouted the land from the wilderness of Zen to Rehob at Lebel ha Hamath. They went up into the Negev and came to Hebron, where live Akiman, Shishai, Talmai, the Anakites. Now Hebron was founded seven years before Zon of Egypt. They reached the Wadi Eshkol, and there they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. It had, been, it had to be borne on a carrying frame by two of them, and some pomegranates and figs. That place was named the Wadi Eshkol because of the cluster that the Israelites cut down there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from scouting the land. They went straight to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. And they made their report to them and to the whole community as they showed them the fruit of the land. This is what they told him. We came to the land you sent us to. It does indeed flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who inhabit the country are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the Anakites there, Amalekites dwell in the Negev region. Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites inhabit the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. Caleb hushed the people before Moses and said, 
Let us by all means go up, and we shall gain possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot attack that people, for it is stronger than we. Thus they spread calumnies among the Israelites about the land they had scouted, saying, The country that we transverse and scouted is one that devours its settlers. All the people that we saw in it are men of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites are part of the Nephilim, Nephilim. And we looked at and we look like grasshoppers to ourselves, so we must have looked to them. The whole community broke into loud cries, and the people wept that night. All the Israelites railed against Moses and Aaron. If only we had died in the land of Egypt. The whole community shouted at them, or if only we might die in this wilderness. Why is the Lord taking us to that land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be carried off. It will be better for us to go back to Egypt. And they said to one another, let us head back for Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembled congregation of the Israelites. And Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, of those who had scouted the land, rent their clothes and exhorted the whole Israelite community. The land that we transverse and scouted is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into the land, a land that flows with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only you must not rebel against the Lord. Have no fear then of the people of the country, for they are our prey. Their protection has departed from them, but the Lord is with us. Have no fear of them, as the whole community threatened to pelt them with stones. The presence of the Lord appeared in the tent of the meeting to all the Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? How long will they have no faith in me, despite all the signs that I have performed in their midst? I will strike them with pestilence and disown them. I will make of you a nation far more numerous than they. But Moses said to the Lord, When the Egyptian from whom missed you, from whom from whose midst you brought up this people in your might hear the news, they will tell it to the inhabitants of that land. Now they have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people, that you, O Lord, appear in plain sight when your cloud rests over them, when you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If then you that slay this people to a man, the nations who have heard your name will say, it must be because the Lord was powerless to bring that people into the land, which he had promised them on oath that he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Therefore, I pray, let my Lord's forbearance be great, as you have declared, saying, The Lord, slow to anger and abounding in kindness, forgiving iniquity and transgression, yet not remitting all punishment, but visiting the iniquity of fathers upon the children, upon the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people, according to your great kindness, as you have forgiven this people, ever since Egypt. And the Lord said, I pardon as you have asked. Nevertheless, as I live, and as the Lord's presence fills the whole world, none of the men who have seen my presence and the signs I have performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and who have tried me these many times have, di and have disobeyed me shall see the land that I promised on oath to their fathers. None of those who spurn me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he was imbued with a different spirit and remained loyal to me, him will I bring into the land which he entered, and his offspring shall hold it as a possession. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites occupy the valleys. Start out then tomorrow and march into the wilderness, wilderness by the way of the Sea of Reeds. The Lord spoke further to Moses and Aaron. How much longer shall, they, shall that wicked community Keep muttering against me. Very well, I have heeded the incessant muttering of the Israelites against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I will do to you just as you have urged me. In this very wilderness shall your carcasses drop. Of all of you who were recorded in your various lists from the age of 20 years up, who mutter against me, 
Not one shall enter the land in which I swore to settle you, save Caleb son of Jephunneh and Joshua son of Nun. Your children who you said would be carried off, these will I allow to enter. They shall know the land that you have rejected. But your carcasses shall drop in this wilderness. While your children roam the wilderness for 40 years, suffering for your faithlessness, until the last of your carcasses is down in the wilderness. You shall bear your punishment for 40 years, corresponding to the number of days, 40 days, that you scouted the land, a year for each day. Thus you shall know what it means to thwart me. I, the Lord, have spoken. Thus will I do to all that wicked band that has banded together against me in this very wilderness. They shall die to the last man. As for the men whom Moses sent to scout the land, who came back and caused the whole community to mutter against him by spreading calumnies against the land, those who spread such calumnies about the land die of, of, of plague by the will of the Lord. Of those men who had gone to scout the land, only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, Jephune, son of Jephune, are survived. When Moses repeated these words to all the Israelites, the people were overcome by grief. Early next morning, they set out toward the crest of the hill country, saying, We are prepared to go up to the place that the Lord has spoken of, for we were wrong. But, Moses said, why do you transgress the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up lest you be routed by your enemies, for the Lord is not in your midst. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be there to face you, and you will fall by the sword. Inasmuch as you have turned from following the Lord, then the Lord will not be with you. Yet defiantly they marched to the crest of the hill, though neither the Lord's Ark of the Covenant nor Moses steered from the camp. And the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that hill country came down and dwelt, dealt them a shattering blow at Hormah. And this is very interesting. Very, very interesting, I think. Um, hold on a minute. Just give me a minute here. Okay, we go back to um, beginning. I'll read you with my notes. A um, couple of striking things here um, is that Moses changed um, the name of Hosea, of uh, son of Nun, to Joshua. And in the commentary, it says in the Hebrew, the change involves the addition of the letter Yud, which is the letter with the letter He, forms part of the Adonai, the, uh, the unutterable name of God, and symbolizes Joshua's future role as Israel leader. Uh, this this Yud He use alone it by itself is um, signifies the divine name, and is frequently uh, used as a suffix to human names, as in uh, Elijah, uh, uh, El Eliyah. Um, so that I thought was uh, interesting. And it also, in my commentary, which I found very interesting, it said that um, Joshua uh, is, um, in, in Nehemiah 8.17, is called by yet a third name, Yeshua, which is which also is the Hebrew name of Jesus. So that's, I think that's very interesting um, right there. That was one of the most interesting things. Um, also, uh, they mentioned the, the fact that there were giants in the land. And uh, because they mentioned that they seemed like grasshoppers. And then I guess that's one of the reasons why they were afraid and uh, so I, I thought that was very interesting, but it mentioned the uh, giants and um, the fact that they went for 40 days scouting at the land and um, um, their, their punishment for, for, for not entering the land is 
uh, number one, that they for 40 years, they're going to have to stay outside the land until all of them die that were on the, the list, I guess on the census list, the ones that were above 20 years of age. And for 40 years, they would not be able to enter into the promised land. And um, uh, the uh, interesting thing from my commentary, and I, and I had to ponder on this, and I'm still pondering on it. It, it talked about what the real sin of, of Israel was. And it said, the spies said, we cannot attack that people for it is stronger than we. Than we, Mimenu, could also be understood as, uh, to understood as than he, which suggests that the spies were say, saying that even God could not overcome uh, the Canaanites. And Israel was punished for this lack of faith in God, not for disbelief in its own strength. And that was said it came from the Talmud. Uh, so I found that very, very interesting that, 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 that they concluded that was their real sin. Um, that not even thinking that God could overcome these these giants. Um, well, only eleven of the twelve thought that. Oh, was it twelve thought ten, that. Ten, ten of them. Ten. Joshua didn't. Jo Joshua and Joshua and um, Caleb. Caleb. Uh -huh. only, only ten thought that. Mm -hmm. um, one um, a commentator pointed out that, um, and I guess you can see it in our everyday walk of life. If you don't want to do something, you can think of reasons not to do it. Yes. Yes. Now, well, and I guess right at the beginning, um, God's idea was for them to simply go into the land. The spy, sending out spies, uh, uh, the idea of sending out spies was not God's idea. So he did say, okay, go ahead and do it. If you want to do it, go ahead and do it. But it was their idea to send spies out. It wasn't God's idea. Mm. But it, it becomes clearer later on, I think, in Deuteronomy. But God's idea was for them to just go in and take the land, but they wanted to send spies. Now, what Moses tried to do, which is quite commendable, you try and pick spiritual people who are... Uh, are who, has, who have strong faith in God, who believe in God, uh, men who thinks, uh, men who believe that, uh, uh, well, let's just say spiritual people, mm -hmm. people who are steeped in belief, you, people you think are very religious because it, it picked chief people. So I'm thinking just didn't pick anyone, just didn't get anyone from each head of the tribe. He tried to get the most religious person he can, but you can't. You don't know a person's spirituality by looking at them. So what I think was, he tried to get the best, but, you know, deep down, they, they were not. Um, what did I say? Part I said, men were sent, but it, w but it was not for their, not for their benefit. Um, because of the sin of the spies, uh, well, actually because of the sin of the spies, Moses had to live another 40 years in the wilderness. And, uh, well, so did all the other people, but Moses was about 80 years old, so he had to spend another 40 years with these people because of this. Uh, the men who were picked were not fully faithful. You can't look at a person and tell their faithfulness uh, or their faithfulness towards God. And we cannot look at a, uh, a person and see their commitment to God. I imagine Moses did the best he could, mm -hmm. but these, in, as it proves out, it's nice to be a Monday morning quarterback, to see that these, the guys that were picked were not fully faithful towards God. They did not, they did not want to go in and take that land, and they were, they came up with one excuse after another. First excuse, well, let's just spy out the land. Second excuse, well, we can't conquer the land that the people are too, too big for us. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, a commentator mentioned was that um, because of this sin and this faithfulness, 
they had time to, to meditate upon what, what, what had happened. And they meditated and, and thought about this and wandered for 40 years, thinking about and meditating on the acts of God and, and how they rebelled against Him. So they had a lot of time to think. A lot of time to prepare for war, too. Right. For 40 years, they ate the same stuff. And it gets a little tiring eating the same stuff. They may have prepared it a different way. Mm -hmm. But there's only so many ways you're going to prepare manna. <laughs> and I don't care how good it tastes, you just, you'll get tired of eating candy bars mm -hmm. for 40 years. I don't care what it is. Uh, you're just going to get tired of it. And I'm sure they were. They were preparing for military, this was a military camp. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine after 40 years in the desert, they would be ready to fight. And... Uh, and go ahead and conquer that land. Now, one other thing that was mentioned, and it was um, a little interesting, they sent men into the land. They didn't send women. And, and they were, uh, maybe the, when a man goes into the land, he knows he's got to work. <laughs> and got to work hard, but that wasn't the commentator's rationale. Their rationale was that women would have a more affinity to the land. Mm -hmm. So you remember the the ladies whose dad had died, and they didn't have they right. didn't have any hurt. They right. didn't say, "Well, no, 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 we want land. We want to settle." Yeah, and uh, you know, some guys. No, hey, uh, one guy did uh, make the comment. Well, the guys had it pretty good. They, they didn't have to do laundry or cook. All women did all that work. But uh, women have a more of a, an affinity to the land than the men have. Uh, but, um, her said. One other comment in there as they uh, summarize that um, the difficulty of, of uh, of conquering the people in the land, and the same things that we might say today. Let me see if I can get uh, uh, when when you talked about the giants and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and we were grasshoppers in that site. What people say now today is say, you know, you know what's going to happen. You take that job, it's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. that, that's the same thing that we say nowadays. Mm -hmm. Um, or they'll say something else or it'll distract from you you won't have a family life or anything like that but that's the thing that uh, we say nowadays but they said they had a different excuse uh, during that time uh, the spies did not want to go did not want to follow God's God's word um They wanted Egypt with the, they wanted to go back to Egypt with a new leader. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I guess they just didn't want to go back on their own. They could, they weren't too far away from Egypt. They could have walked back. Uh, only Caleb, uh, only Caleb spoke. And one mentioned the idea, well, Joshua probably didn't speak because he was a student of Moses. And they probably wouldn't have accepted what he was saying that, that readily. Saying, oh, you're just saying what, that because that's what Moses said. So, only uh, one person spoke up. Uh, interesting saying that Moses appealed to God for his kindness. Not because he was powerful. Well, when, when God wanted to wipe out the Israelites right. and start over with Moses. Um, Moses didn't agree. He one he said that um, well the you know the Egyptians are going to hear about it and they're going to figure out well you couldn't bring them in. If the Egypt says well you know their God is he might be powerful he can defeat one God but he can't defeat thirty one so he's going to kill them. Um, so you know he can defeat us but once he gets to to thirty one gods he couldn't he couldn't overcome them so he killed them 
So Moses wasn't didn't appeal to God's uh, power or truth. He only appealed to his kindness. Now sometimes you think when we talk, we almost always talk about God's power or the truth. Uh, some you do hear of his loving kindness and his uh, his mercy. But I think we talk more of his power more so than his kindness. But that's what he appealed to, God's kindness, not to, to wipe them out. Uh, so that the Egyptians wouldn't have anything to say about him. Mm -hmm. um, I think some folks nowadays, they may say, well, we don't care what they say, you know, uh, God can do it. But it's, uh, uh, people are going to talk. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say certain things about God. Right. And, um, you know, God, you can't just say, well, God is powerful, he can do anything he wants. But this was appealed to his, uh, God's loving kindness. I thought about pain, which I think about a lot nowadays. Mm -hmm. And uh, many folks tend to say that, well, they try and discredit God because folks are in pain. But they never talk, they're not in pain themselves, and they never talk to a person that's in pain. Mm -hmm. uh, you no, know, God is so powerful, uh, why don't they just do away with pain? But sometimes other things uh, God will not use, he'll use something else. Loving kindness is, is another one, or truth is another one. Or forgiveness is something else. Not because he's powerful doesn't mean he uses his power at, at all times. Right. Because he's all, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although he is powerful, yes. Um, could he have just put the folks in the land? Uh, in a sense, yes, but not if they didn't want to go. Because they didn't, they were making excuses. God won't do violence on an individual. Hmm. And I think my final thought. which I mentioned earlier, that uh, living in the wilderness could not be pleasant. Mm -hmm. Doing and eating things every day, doing and eating the same things every day. Now, they didn't have a lot of, you know, they didn't have iPads and phones and movies to go to. It was a very basic and simple life. And they didn't move that much while they were in that wilderness either. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it wasn't very easy. It wasn't very pleasant. And in some respects, they were in, in military training. It was uh, the way the uh, camp was structured, was set up with the various tribes. Mm -hmm. um, one commentator mentioned, I didn't mention it a few weeks ago, it was almost like a military setup. Exactly. But uh, that's what was going on. And um, exactly. they were they were being trained for battle. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that goes to what um, what was happening before they left Egypt. Um, and just before they did the Passover, the Hebrew word that when they told them to gird themselves, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it means gird yourself with your weapon. Right. And it called them the army of God. Right. They were indeed an army of God. And you're right. That's why they were, they were in battle uh, formation. Um, the trumpet, they knew when to go because the trumpet, certain sound, and then one section goes and everything because they, they were, they were a battle and it wasn't just a battle. Um, this is, this is like a, um, uh, a battle for, for the hearts and soul of mankind. Mm -hmm. This is not just in a moment thing like this. God is using these people in order to bring forth the Messiah who will ultimately in the, in the final battle defeat. Satan. Right. So this is the army. If they are indeed an army, you're right. They and God is training this army. They are in training, mm -hmm. whether they know it or not. And that God and he and and they just didn't realize the power that they had because, like David, when David went to um, go against Goliath, he went. He had what five smooth stones right. and a slingshot. But he said he comes in the name of the Lord God of Hosts. Mm -hmm. That's what they had. And um, this soliloquy, this you were talking about God, yeah, God could have just put them in the land or whatever, but God is trying to work out a plan here. 
God is trying to right a wrong that was done in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And so he has to let this play out. Mm -hmm. And I find it very interesting of this conversation that Moses has with God. Don't, don't you think that God already knew this, what Moses was saying to him? God already knew that the nations probably would think that he killed them, that, um, um, uh, that, they, that they would think that God was impotent and everything. But again, rather than God um, with a heavy fist or a heavy hand, God is eliciting a lot of things. He elicited a lot of things. So here Moses becomes an intercessor. He, he's, develop, he's developing there. He's developed that God, and I'm sure he was, God was doing that. He was trying to elicit this from Moses. He's an intercessor. He's looking over these people. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure, yeah, he could have put Israel in the land, but God is trying to get them to realize they are able, as long as he's with them, they are able to do what? Um, anything. As they found out, because all of a sudden they come to their senses and say, okay, the next day, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and take the land. Where, no, you're not going to take it because God isn't with you. The ark wasn't there and God wasn't there. And they were going to do it on their own. And they found out on their own, they can't do it. But with the God of Israel going before them, they can so that's another lesson they learn. Um, and then another thing, that, too. That's something else they, they'll have mm -hmm. to make, they can think about for those who are Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then, then here's another thing that I thought was here when they were moaning and whatever, and they were saying, oh, um, if we'd only died in Egypt. I mean, what a thing to say. And the whole community shouted at them as only we might die and said, or if only we might die in the wilderness. Why would you say that? Why would you say such a thing? And then, so what God, what does God say later on after he is finished? Up, he says, okay, as you want it to, you will die in the wilderness. As you said, you will die in the wilderness. Because you said it. That's what you want. That's what you got. And that's a, that's a scary thing. Yeah, well, I mean, that was acceptable to you. It's acceptable to me. That's a scary thing. That is a scary, scary thing. And um, so that's, that's we, we, we need, when we're challenging the God of the universe, we need to be very careful what we say. I mean, I, I mean, what arrogance is that to say to the God of the universe? Oh, if we had only died, um, died in the, um, uh, in, the in the wilderness. I mean, that's 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 arrogance. Uh, and so God gave them their God gave them their wish. He gave them their wish. I think they chalked up to a lack of faith in God. Yes, and, uh, it is a lack of faith in God. Yeah. And, the, and, and and here they have, and then and then when it, when and let's go to the end. What God is trying to elicit from Israel is that. With me, you can conquer the world. And when they realize that, when it, 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 at the final battle, when, when Satan is trying to defeat them, when they realize that their, their, their greatest weapon is God, if they only did what God said, God said, if you only do what I say, then I will fight your battles. I will do this. I, you won't have to do a thing. I will do it. When, when, and, and I say that about us. When we finally realize Who's the source of our strength? Then we'll be okay. Cause it ain't the government. They can't do jack. They're just men. When we realize that it's the God of the universe who is in charge, who is able to do exceedingly above all that we could ever hope to imagine, we put our faith in Him. Then we are going to achieve what we need to. When we finally get to that point, say God, we trust you. We're going to do what you ask us to do. Then God said, Okay, I've been waiting for you to do that. And he takes over. So, um, and that's what I think God is trying to elicit from Israel. Just remember what I said. He said, follow my rules. I'll fight your battles for you. Those giants, I'm the God of the universe. I made those giants. I'll take care of them. If you would just do what I say. And that's what he, again, I think God is, he's a teacher. And he's patiently, he does his kindness as, he patiently just sits back and and tries to direct us in the right way 
And he's a patient. I mean, his patience, oh my gosh. Because Moses appealed to his kindness and his patience. Mm -hmm. Moses appealed to that. And so, um, and it said he was slow to anger, abounding in kindness, forgiving, and not remitting all punishment, visiting the iniquity, not remit, and not, not that he's not a just God. Say, I know you're a just God. Because those those remitting the um, the uh, punishment to the uh, the third and fourth generations, but he said, "Pardon, I pray this iniquity." And so I said, "Okay." Nevertheless, <laughs> as I live, the Lord's mm -hmm. presence fills this whole world, and the, none of those men who have seen my presence and the signs I have performed in Egypt and the wilderness, who have cried, tried me these many times and have disobeyed me, they shall not see the land that I promised. Yeah. And so this is, I think this is a God, uh, a, a, um, a moment when God is, 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 is again training his army. Mm -hmm. He's training his army because they indeed are the army of the Lord. All right. We'll have a break before we go on to the second part, unless you have something else to add. There was one other thing, and I can't remember fully what it talked about, but it mentioned a good land. But that had a spiritual tone to it. Mm. Had to do with um, um, how should I say uh, living there in that good land and the spiritual ramification and I don't know are you smarter and yeah, it said exceedingly good land mm. not just uh, fertile with crops and uh, things of that nature, mm -hmm. but good in the sense of uh, a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. And I should have made more notes on that, I think, than I did. Um, but did your, any of your commentators make any uh, About whether well, this is a spiritual? Yeah. Um, uh, Uh, I don't remember them saying anything about being a spiritual, um, but well, in a sense, it could be spirit. Yes, in a sense, because again, something the interesting thing is, before they went in, and I'm sure it is a spiritual. I, I'm surprised that they even refer to, uh, in my card to Jesus, the fact that Moses changed Joshua's name. And uh, well, ch well, ch his name was Hosea, yeah. and changed it to Joshua, which is which is the Hebrew, <clears throat> which is the Hebrew pronunciation of Jesus, and he added a yud, again the yud and the hey, I mean very significant in the Hebrew, <clears throat> because <clears throat> it connects to the divine, right, and mm. and so yeah, I I kind of think it is a spiritual thing that it is a spiritual thing. It is not just a physical land they're conquering. It is also a spiritual thing because when you, when um, uh, it's very it's very significant when somebody's name is changed. Remember Paul in the um, in the New Testament when his name is changed after his after he meets with Jesus on the road to Damascus to mm -hmm. Damascus, and um, so so yes, I think this is about this is and and really again this is about. This is a, a battle for the souls of mankind. By God forming this army right here, it is an, it's an earthly army, but it also is um, um, an earthly army performing things that will free mankind from the sin that happened in the Garden of Eden. So this is a continuity, it's just a continuing of the story where God is trying to uh, right the wrong that was done in Garden of Eden. That's that's what this is. We are on a continuation here. And he's using the nation of Israel and this land of Israel in order to accomplish those things. Mm. So. <clears throat> Who I mentioned, his name was changed also because his roles had changed too. Or would be changed. It, it would be changed, but it, when, you, when you take in consideration that his name is now his name means salvation. Oh. Joshua Yeshua means salvation. So it's this is it's a you can read into it whatever you want, but the fact that again, it's almost like he get, he was given a special spirit because he was given the yud and the hay, and the yud and the hay alone connotes mm -hmm. 
the name of God of Adonai. So that that in itself was very interesting, very momentous. Um, so we have a momentous occasion here with the land, and again, him trying to connect the people with the land and um, getting them to see the importance of the land. As you said, again, that's that's always the that's that's the thing that God is trying to get Israel, even present day Israel, to see the importance of the land because there are a lot of uh, Jewish people who don't see the importance of the land, and I'm talking about the whole land of Israel, not just Tel Aviv and and um, 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 Tel Aviv and Haifa. I'm talking about Judea and Samaria, and there are a lot who don't see the importance of that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Well, we'll take a break, and uh, we'll continue our table talk after our break. And it was a sh it's a short partial this week, but I think it's probably the one that has the most meat because it is talking about the land. Okay, all right, and give me a few minutes and we'll we'll continue. This is very good wine. Okay. Very good wine. <laughs> and I, I find it interesting. It was talking about the, the grapes that they had to have two men for one cluster of grapes. Mm -hmm. I can't. I mean. You have to imagine that. That's a big cluster of grapes. That's a big cluster of grapes. So, called various laws and fringes. And it's in Numbers chapter 15, verses 1 through 41. John? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have come into the land, you are to inhabit, which I am giving to you. And you make an offering by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice, to fulfill a vow, or as a free will offering, or in your appointed feast. To make a sweet aroma to the Lord from the herd or the flock. Then he who presents his offering to the Lord shall bring a grain offering of one tenth of an ephod of fine flour mixed with one fourth of an hem of hen of oil and one fourth of a hen of wine as a drink offering. And shall present and, and shall prepare with the burnt offering or the sacrifice of each lamb. Or for a ram you shall prepare as a grain offering one tenth of an ephod of fine flour mixed with one third of hen of oil. And as a drink offering you shall offer one third of a hen of wine as a sweet aroma to the Lord. And when you prepare a young bull as a burnt offering, or as a sacrifice to fulfill a vow, or as a peace offering to the Lord, then you shall offer with the young bull a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephod of fine flour, mixed with a hen, mixed with half a hen of oil, and you shall bring as the drink offering half a hen of wine as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. Thus it shall be done for each young bull, for each ram, or for each lamb, or young goat, 
according to the number that you prepare. So you shall do with, do with everyone according to their number. All who are native born shall be shall do these things in this manner, in preparing an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And if a stranger dwells with you, or whoever is among you throughout your generation, and which presents an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord, just as you do, so shall he do. One ordinance shall be for you uh, of the assembly, and one for the stranger who dwells with you. An ordinance forever throughout your generation as you are. So shall the stranger be before the Lord. One law, one law and one custom shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells with you. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land to which I bring you, then it will be when you eat of the bread of the land that you shall offer up a heave, heave offering to the Lord. You shall offer up a cake of the first of your ground meal as a heave offering, as a heave offering of the threshing floor, so shall you offer it, yeah, offer it up. Of the first of your ground meal, you shall give to the Lord a heave offering throughout your generations. If you sin unintentionally and do not observe all these commandments which the Lord has spoken to Moses, all this the Lord has commanded you by the hand of Moses from the day the Lord gave commandments and onwards throughout your generation. Then it will be, if it is unintentionally committed without the knowledge of the congregation that the whole congregation shall offer one bull as a burnt offering, as a sweet aroma to the Lord. With, the, with its grain offering and its drink offering according to the ordinance, ordinance, and one kid of the goats as a sin offering. So the priest shall bring atonement for the for the whole congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it is unintentional. unintentional. They shall bring their offering, an offering made by fire to the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their unintentional sin. It shall be forgiven the whole congregation of the children of Israel and, and the stranger who dwells among them, because all the people did it unintentionally. And if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in, in its first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally. When he sins unintentionally before the Lord to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, for him who is a native born among the children of Israel and for the stranger who dwells among them. But the people who do anything presumptu presumptuously 
whether he is native born or a stranger, that one that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people, because he has uh, displeased the word of the Lord. I'm sorry, despised the word of the Lord, and has broken his commandments. That person shall be completely cut off. Uh, his guilt shall be upon him. Now while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him under guard because it was not uh, because it had not been explained that should be done to it had not been explained what should be done to him. Then the Lord said to Moses, The man must surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside the camp. So as the Lord commanded Moses, all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. Again the Lord said to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garment throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread on the tassel of each corner of the corners. And you shall have the tassels that you make look up, look upon it. And you shall have the tassel that you may uh, that you, that you may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them, and that you may not follow the holotry to which your own to which your own heart and your own eyes have are inclined. And that you may remember and do all of my commandments and be holy for the Lord. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Look. What say ye? <laughs> Well, I don't know what kind of what this guy was doing picking up sticks. I don't know. I guess they couldn't figure it out either, so they brought it to Moses. But well, it was a capital offense. Well, in my my um, um, Torah, in the commentary, they say that this man was. Hold on a minute. Uh, this man was. Okay, the, they said that the rabbis identified the offender as Zelophehad. He was the father of those five daughters that you mentioned before. Um. That's who they said that this uh, was. Um. And the the injunction not to kindle a fire was forbidden, so you have to conclude that if he was going to kindle the fire, it wasn't going to be for holy purposes. Just like the sons of Aaron, it was Aaron? Aaron's son kindled a, a fire, an unholy fire. But they didn't go into detail, but they were just picking up sticks. No, it was more, I'm sure it was more than that. It's the, it, they, the detail was they assume it says he's gathering wood, it, probably in order to make a fire, which was forbidden on the Sabbath. Right. So, it, and again, remember we talked last week. A lot of times, it's it seems simple and straightforward, but a lot of times it talks about uh, euphemisms, like when people are getting ready to engage in some kind of debauchery, and mm -hmm. surely he knew the law that you don't kindle a fire. On the Sabbath, 
So whatever he was doing was, and he, sure he was gathering sticks, but what was he gathering sticks for? The kindle of fire for what purpose? It wasn't for a holy purpose, because you don't kindle a fire on the Sabbath. It was well, something for some debauchery. I remember in the people who were looked for manna on the Sabbath day, but they didn't get stoned. The guy, the, yes, he did. Yes, the guy did. He went out. Yes, he did. The people who were the man for man who went out, um, who went out looking for manna. Didn't he get killed? I didn't think so. Yeah, I believe so. All right, we can look at that later. Okay. Um, there was one law for the Israelite, and there was one law for the stranger, for sacrifices and atonement. One law for intentional sin and one law for an unintentional sin. Um, kind of almost like the rehearsal of the various offerings that are made. But I didn't have much for this particular chapter. Well, I thought this was, um, I, what I thought was fascinating from the beginning of the chapter to the end, it keeps reiterating that there's one law for the Israelites and the same law for the strangers. So then you can conclude a lot of things from that. If that's the case, then the stranger probably is going to know the laws of Israel. Uh, if they're going to be with the people, they're going to know, need to know the law. Because if they're living there and they transgress a law, then they're going to be held accountable just as the Israelites are. So I found that mm -hmm. uh, fascinating. And um, that um, um, let's see what I put um, the thirty two thirty oh um, yeah that was that was that was what I got out of that from verse one through thirty six again is you know again there's one law there's one law to observe one commandment. Um, uh, so, so anyway, that's a whole nother thing too, because again, like I was saying, you could, the stranger would certainly, if the stranger's living amongst them, they certainly have to be schooled in the law. Mm -hmm. They most certainly have to be schooled in the law. Mm -hmm. And then the other, from verses 37 through 41, where they are commanded to do the fringes on the corner, which are called seat seat. Uh, and a lot of times you'll see Orthodox Jewish men with the little strings hanging down their pants. Right. Sometimes they put them in their pocket, but you sit them on the side. And I find that interesting, too, that God, because God says he wants this to be a reminder so that they do not follow their heart and, and eyes and your lustful urge. Because uh, like someone said the men men need that reminder more than women because they are they are they're visual and hopefully with the seat seat hanging down they won't engage in no debauchery. <laughs> when you once you touch the seat seat, you say, "Oh, God is you know I'm 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 uh, God is watching." So uh, I th I thought that very interesting that God would. Um, uh, have this, would have them do this. And, and he clearly states why he wants them to do it so they don't engage in any uh, lust. And the and, mm -hmm. end is to remind them to observe all of his commandments and to be holy. Say, I, the Lord, am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I, the Lord, your God. So I, I, I thought that very interesting. But it did say speak to the children of Israel, not necessarily just to the guys. Well, they well, the, I, I think it's the guys. Mm -hmm. They're referring to the men. Okay. Because uh, I had a study where they said if it says children of Israel, it's usually the men that they're referring to. But in in Judea, I'm just and also I'm just referring to. Well, the translation may have maybe lacking there. Mm -hmm. But. Um, But uh, anyway, all right. Well, that that ends the portion. We had a um, 
we had a um, it was a short Parsha, but it was powerful. Mm -hmm. Powerful Parsha. Yeah. So we continue on because it is a struggle. God is 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 has this group of people who he's who are his army and he's trying to train them and and get them to do what he says do and it seems to be a it's a difficult task if, if, because they come out of slavery and I'm sure that can't be too easy to try and um to um um have people who just come out of slavery and, and you and you have to first of all get them to to know that they are free now and it can't be an easy task it cannot be an easy task at all mm -hmm. so and I often I often wonder about our our ancestors and you could think about how they how they reacted just coming out of slavery I mean that must have been a jolt uh, you know, to to be owned by someone, and then, and and yeah. and then, um, uh, being told where you can go and where you can't go, and it was a joke because again, uh, because the system followed at least in the South, and I'm sure in a in a form in other areas of the country, that it followed them that they weren't completely free because there were the Jim Crow laws, which said no, you you may be free, we don't own you, but you still mm -hmm. can't go into any store you want to drink from in a water fountain or whatever. So it was a gradual, it was almost, you know, I guess maybe like a gradual release. And it's still, people are still, are not free in their minds. Because the mind is the, is the most difficult thing to change. You can change someone's physical uh, whereabouts, but if you don't, if you can't change the mind, the mindset, they still maybe leave their slaves. And maybe that was part of what, uh, when the, like you said, they want you that they, they, you can come up with any excuse you you want to if you don't want to do something, and maybe having been enslaved, they didn't have to worry about those kinds of things. But now, here they are, a nation, and they've got a they've got to fend for themselves. They don't have an army that they can call upon, or they are the army, and so it takes a while to 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 get. And I guess it took a generation because that's what happened. The, the ones who said they couldn't, well, they died in the wilderness. And, and God used that next generation to, to conquer the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So next week, we have a rebellion. Korok. You mean another rebellion? Korok. It's the rebellion of Korok. With Dathan and Abiram. Now, yes, another rebellion. And that's going to be Numbers chapter 16, verse 1 through 18, chapter 32. And it says, Ve'yakak Korak ben Yitzhar ben Kahat ben Levi ve'Dathan ve'Aviram b'nei Eliav Ve on ben pelat bene rauben. Now Korak, the son of Ishar, son of Kohat, son of Levi, betook himself along with Dathan and Abiram, sons of Eliab, and On, son of Peleth, descendants of Reuben, to rise up against Moses together with 250 Israelites, chieftains of the community, chosen in the assembly. Men of repute. Now that's a teaser there. The descendants of Reuben and Le Levi. 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 That's interesting. That combination. So again, we have a. a back and, back. and we have uh, uh, Moses again. His authority is being questioned. It's being questioned. So. That should be very interesting for next week in our table talk. Okay. Anything else you'd like to say? No, I hope they're enjoying the table talk. I hope so too. And so we will see everyone next week. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Have a good week. 
and uh, we'll see you for table talk, Shabbat table talk again next week with the Parsha Korach. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.